All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this session. Uh, I'm Junjie from Intel, who has been working on functional safety uh, certification of the open source hypervisor Acorn for three years. And in this session, I'm glad to share uh, this our experience with the certification as a case study of how open source software can be certified for functional safety. So this will be the agenda for today's session. So we'll first briefly introduce what is functional safety and what is ACON itself. And then we share some key challenges and uh, daily working model changing practices we apply when we certify ACON. So first, about functional safety itself. So according to the Wikipedia, uh, the definition of functional safety or the definition of safety in general is the freedom from unacceptable risk of physical injury or of damage to the health of people, either directly or indirectly. So here, uh, this, uh, the freedom from unacceptable risk means that we accept the fact that risk, residual risk will always be there. And even we use a piece of hardware or software in safety critical uses, uh, we need to define a certain level of the extent of risk that we can tolerate. And this naturally derives the a level of different uh, safety criticality or the safety critical, uh, the, the safety integrity level defined by the functional safety standards. And what is special to functional safety is that uh, the safety is achieved not by hardening the function uh, itself, but by the proper implementation of one or more automatic protection functions. So here uh, in our presentation, we will refer to these automatic protection functions as safety functions following the terminology of IEC 61508, which is a functional safety standard. And these safety functions, of course, need to be properly implemented to make sure that it will function as expected and the failure of itself can be uh, handled in a, say, in a safe way. So talking about software, so what does functional safety require for a piece of software? Then? Of course, uh, we already know that the ultimate goal of functional safety is to mitigate risk. And in the context of software, which only have systematic failures, the goal becomes to, mit to the mitigation of risk from systematic failures. And in this presentation, we will scope ourselves with a IEC 61508, which is the standard we uh, certify against uh, in our previous certification. And we will only talk about all out of context certification, it means that uh, the software is certified with assumptions on the uses of, of the software itself. But uh, in our case, we don't have uh, already a system level understanding or a concrete customer which defines their uh, system where the acorn is to be used. And as a result, we cannot do in-context certification. So in, our, in this presentation, we will share our knowledge based on the out-of-context certification. And of course, we are talking about software here. So the basic strategies uh, to achieve this risk mitigation goal uh, is uh, uh, include the fail-safe uh, principle and the fault avoidance. So first, the fail-safe means that we accept the fact there will always be uh, failures, and we, make, we need to make sure that the software that is safety critical or safety related needs to have the fail-safe uh, principle in mind. That is, we have a clear idea of what kind of faults that can be detected by the software, by the safety related software, and once detected, how these faults can be uh, handled in a safe way. And the second, uh, once we have this piece of software, which is designed to handle failures, then itself uh, needs to be developed uh, with, a, uh, with a certain level of uh, uh, reliability. So that, so that is, we need systematic management and systematically develop the, soft, the piece of soft software we define to implement the safety function. So here, systematic means 
the management or the development activities are conducted with plans before these activities are conducted and the evidence that the activities are conducted following the plan is uh, collected throughout the uh, practice of the management or development. That is throughout the life cycle of the software. So that's about functional safety, but what is functional safety certification? So the result or the output of a round of functional safety certification is to get a certificate from a third party certification body uh, saying that the piece of software uh, under certification is being developed uh, 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 in, a, in a way that is compliant to the functional safety standard and thus it is proper to use this piece of software in safety critical uses. So according to the standards or the functional safety standards, uh, there are three routes to achieve a functional safety certificate. So the first uh, or the, the most straightforward way not, is that uh, the piece of software is developed in a way that is compliant to the standard. So the functional safety standard itself defines uh, how the management shall be conducted. It also defines a few requirements and recommended measures that need to be adopted when develop the software. So a compliant develop means all these requirements and recommended measures are properly adopted and fulfilled. The second route is that is the proving in use. If the piece of software has already been used in safety critical uh, situations for many hours, then these statistics and its failure rates can be used as a statement uh, uh, in the proving use route to achieve a certificate. So this will definitely not be the scope, the focus of our presentation today. Our, our focus will be the third route, which is also the route Acron uses, that is the assessment of non-compliant development. So a piece of open source software is typically developed uh, for general purpose uh, from day one, maybe at, and at, later on, uh, we decide to reuse this piece of software in safety critical situations. And this is where the assessment of non-compliant development development route applies. So to uh, do the certification or to achieve a certificate, uh, we interact with a third party certification body within a multiple uh, interaction uh, with multiple interaction. So as we have mentioned that uh, functional safety requires the software to be developed and managed in a systematic way, which means we need to have plans of the activities beforehand. So the first set of work products we uh, deliver to the certification body is not about the design, architecture design or even the implementation of the hypervisor, but first a set of plans. So based on a basic concept what, uh, of what the hypervisor is, we first deliver a set of plans of the activities and processes we adopt during the development of the hypervisor. So after the delivery, the certification body will assess and uh, you know, ask questions and raise opens to the plans, uh, making sure that the planned activities are compliant with the standard. And of course, there could be multiple interactions afterwards to uh, clarify the questions or close the gap. But once the plan is settled, we start delivering uh, our uh, development work products. So the first batch is the requirement and architecture design specifications, with the second batch being the detailed design derived from the architecture design and the uh, concrete implementation. And followed by that is the test activity. So the first of all is the test plans. So the objectives, strategies of the test activities, and the test specifications, which define the test cases we use during our, uh, during our test. And finally, the test reports showing that uh, our implementation fulfilled or passes the, the test, and in case of failure, uh, why we uh, accept or why we deviate from the defined requirements and whether that has been recorded in manuals like safety manuals or user manuals to let this system integrator know uh, what are the non-issues of the hypervisor. So all these manuals are subject to be assessed as well. So 
So the certification body will assess all these four products according to the requirements from the standard and raise questions during the, during the visit. And there could be multiple rounds of interactions, again, to close the gaps identified in the previous uh, work product. And these interactions can actually uh, overlap. Uh, so you may have two batch of work products delivered and uh, followed by some responses uh, to the previous questions and then the other batches uh, of your work products. So once all the work products have been delivered, uh, reviewed with the questions and opens, clarified and closed, uh, we get a certificate from the certific certification body, uh, which state the properness of using the piece of software in safety critical case, uh, usages. So this is how, from technical perspective, uh, we interact with the certification body to get the certificate. So that, uh, this is how we work with the certification body uh, in our previous experience. All right, so much about an introduction to functional safety and functional safety assessment. Uh, in the next few pages, I will briefly introduce what is ACORN itself. So ACORN is a Linux Foundation project which implements a flexible and lightweight reference hypervisor. So it is built uh, majorly, mainly for real-time and mixed criticality uh, scenarios. So the architecture of ACORN is like this. Uh, ACORN itself has a hypervisor, which is a type 1 hypervisor, that is, it runs on bare metal directly. And one of its key capability is to partition the hardware into uh, multiple parts. So in one part, you can have a separate VM owning, it, owning its own hardware resources like processors, memory, and devices. While in another part, you may have multiple VMs, with one of them being the so-called service VM, which manages the rest of the VMs and where the device model runs or device sharing. And in the same part, you may have multiple other VMs running less critical uh, software like uh, machine learning or HMI logic or your other computation logic. So in the safety critical scenario, we assume that uh, the safety functions uh, are from, user, from the system integrators run in a, in a petition uh, with no service VM. That is, it is launched by the hypervisor directly with resource isolation guaranteed by the hypervisor only. So followed by the br a brief introduction of functional safety and ACO, uh, the rest of this session will cover three major challenges we have met during our previous experience and how we tackle them uh, we will briefly introduce our approaches that has been uh, uh, proved feasible to uh, to certify a piece of open source uh, a piece of self open source software. So the first challenge we met is to define the safety function that is implemented by the hypervisor. But uh, this is required because we need to first uh, at least uh, clarify why the hypervisor needs to be certified uh, at all. So uh, from the definition of functional safety, we can know that a piece of so software is subject to certification if it is part of a safety function or it may impact existing safety function. So as a piece of hypervisor, we hardly know the uh, business logic. That is, we have no idea what kind of sensor inputs uh, users or system integrators may have and what kind of actuator outputs uh, they, may, they may want to generate to the actual uh, actuators. So as a result, uh, precisely speaking, the hypervisor alone does not implement any safety function, but rather its main objective is to consolidate multiple software stack with mixed criticality and so, some of which implements safety function. So uh, a failure inside the hypervisor may result in the breakage of uh, the consolidated uh, safety function. So actually the ACON falls into the second category. So this, uh, this is also known as interference uh, in the standards. So talking about uh, impact uh, to these safety functions or interference uh, on the safety function, there are two uh, sources. One is that the hypervisor itself 
is uh, breaking the safety function. This can do to uh, mainly two reasons. The first is that the hypervisor virtualizes the uh, platform in an incorrect way, or causing the safety function to uh, respond in an un unexpected manner. And second is that if there is no safety without real time, so the additional overhead introduced by a hypervisor may break the real time property of the safety function, leading it to miss uh, its real time requirements. So this is also a kind of failure for safety function. So talking about the incorrect virtualization, there can be multiple uh, reasons. One is that the hypervisor is corrupting of VM states. And the second is that the hypervisor provides a responses to the VM in an unexpected way, that is, uh, in, in a way that deviates from the existing hardware specifications. And also, uh, in the worst case, the hypervisor may even block the execution of the safety function. So all these may are typically due to uh, faults or uh, errors inside the hypervisor. And talking about additional delay, which is typical for all kinds of virtualization solutions, uh, it may delay the execution of the safety function, or it may delay the delivery of events, the asynchronous events typically interrupt to the safety function. So both of, both of which will delay the overall execution of safety function and causing real uh, deadline misses. So the second uh, category of interference or is that a, the, a failure inside the hypervisor may allow other partitions to impact the safety function. Again, uh, this can be further categorized into two subcategories. One is that uh, the uh, other partitions are, are, uh, has a possibility to corrupt the memory or storage used by the partition that runs the safety function which is also known as the spatial uh, interference. And the second category, delay of execution uh, due to uh, the sharing of hardware resources like last level caches or peripheral bandwidth, uh, et cetera. Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, very heavy workloads inside one partition can typically lead to delay in the execution of other partitions. So this is also known as the effect of noisy neighbors. And this definitely needs, also needs to be considered when we define uh, the hypervisor. So our, our approach to uh, mitigate the interference mentioned uh, earlier in order to protect the safety functions are as follows. So for the errors, uh, or for the uh, uh, errors due to the, uh, due to the hypervisor itself, so for the incorrect virtualization part, uh, we apply systematic development of ACON, which means we define the requirements or the expected external behavior of the hypervisor, and we have excessive tests to verify that the implementation fulfills the requirements. And in addition, during the requirement definition and the architecture uh, design, uh, we, are also, uh, we also apply the principle of being defensive to hardware errors, that is, Whenever uh, there is a possibility that the hypervisor is capable of detecting a hardware error, uh, we, apply, we design a defensive approach to make sure that we fail in the safe way. And with regard to the additional delay, as a, as a piece of out-of-context software, uh, we have no like, criteria to uh, make sure that uh, the delay introduced by the hypervisor is tolerable in the overall system. So uh, in, the, in that case, what we uh, turned out to do in our certification is that uh, we conducted a performance evaluation to uh, showcase what's the worst case a delay of different kinds of reasons. And these numbers are provided in the safety manual for system integrators to reference so that they can know uh, what kind of delay they, can, they may expect and whether their system, overall system, can tolerate these additional overheads. And in addition to that, for uh, as a uh, bottom line uh, approach, we also assume that there will be a hardware watchdog uh, which monitors 
the execution of the safety function to make sure that the safety function completes in a designed uh, time. So it does not miss deadline and it does, does not complete uh, too early. So this hardware mechanism also serves as the bottom line to catch and handle uh, these deadline misses. So for the uh, interference from other VMs or from other partitions, uh, for the memory corruption or public corruption or in general spatial uh, interference, uh, the hypervisor is required to leverage hardware capabilities uh, to implement mechanisms to avoid that. And for the execution delay, we will cover in more details in the next page, since it is worth mentioning uh, a bit more. Uh, to uh, fully understand what kind of uh, temporal interference that can be, uh, can be caused by a non-safe partition, uh, it is worth uh, applying a systematic um, interference analysis. So again here, systematic means we have a defined approach. It is not ad hoc. It is not uh, purely based on experience, but it is based on the systematic, a structured approach, for example, a defined or a widely adopted checklist. And we understand uh, for each item or for each failure mode in the checklist, how uh, that applies to the assumed uses of the hypervisor and how we react to them. So the way we do is that we leverage a checklist in literature on temporal interference. So in our case, we use the uh, checklist uh, pre 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 presented by Kodama et al. in the public paper. And for each failure mode in it, we have a detailed analysis of whether each failure mode applies to us or not. And if that failure mode applies, uh, how do we mitigate that? So the result can be uh, additional requirements to the hypervisor, or, or it may require the hypervisor to like partition the physical processes. It may require the hypervisor to leverage hardware mechanisms uh, to isolate the RAM that each VM can access. Or the analysis, the analysis may derive assumptions of use. Uh, for example, whether uh, we assume that there is a hardware watchdog monitoring the execution of the safety function externally, and there could be some other assumptions of use on the, at, the same thing, at the system level. And these assumptions of use will be recorded in the safety manual for, for the system integrators. So the system integrators can know uh, when they integrate the ACO hypervisor into their overall system, what they need to uh, check and guarantee uh, at system level. So with all these activities, uh, we define the basic concept of the hypervisor, what's, uh, or what's the safety related functionalities it needs to achieve, uh, and what, what are the assumptions of use derived from these activities. So, so the next step is to implement that. But before we do that, uh, we need to set up supporting processes, which turned out to be another challenge during our certification. So when talking about a functional safety compliant development. So from developer's perspective, maybe the first impression is that uh, we need to comply with this V model. So uh, with, in addition to like develop the actual implementation, the V model requires that we have a, a separate phase uh, at the very beginning to define the and spe uh, specify the requirements of this software. So these requirements need to be organized systematically and stated in a semi-formal way to make sure that it is concise it's, uh, and complete, and it fulfills some other requirements to good requirements. To good requirements. And from that, uh, the V-model requires a derivation of the architectural design from the requirements and the derivation of the detailed design from the architectural design. And for each round of derivation, a verification is required. That is, we need to verify the derived work product with, uh, with regard to the completeness, uh, concise uh, correctness, and consistency with regard uh, against the previous uh, or the, uh, the uh, upper level work product. And, and also, uh, the, uh, lower level, uh, the lower level work products needs to trace back to the higher level work products to aid the verification activity. And in addition to all these uh, development activities, on the right side of the V model, 
uh, there are multiple layers, uh, multiple levels of tail. So the, uh, the uh, software under development needs to be exercised at module level, at integration level, and at external, at, at requirement level. So all these activities are essential uh, for a systematic uh, development of a piece of software for functional safety. But in addition to that, before we start the development or start following this new model, we need to have a clear a set of clearly defined supporting processes. So these are also important because these processes are meant to be conducted in a, again, systematic way. So they need to be planned beforehand, and we need to follow this these uh, processes uh, along with the development of the software. So, but, uh, unfortunately, uh, most of the supporting processes are already best practices for software engineering in general, and even for a piece of open source software like us, uh, most of them are actually naturally maps to our daily practices. So for these activities, what we did is to wrap up what we are already doing as plans and provide evidence to the uh, certification bodies to uh, justify that they are followed exact, uh, in a precise way. But still, there are two supporting processes that somehow change our daily working model. That is the configuration management and change management. So the configuration management uh, or the objective of co uh, configuration management is to achieve a consistent uh, set of work products to make sure that the work products are delivered in a, in a, in a consistent way and, 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 under good and under good management. So our typical open source practice is that we have maybe a single Git repository, which we have all the code there, as well as some kind of documentation. And the releases, the versions are always ma are managed by this Git repository alone. But considering the functional safety practice, in addition to the code or some ad hoc documentations, which of course we still have, we also have some other activities generating other work products, like the, the specifications, uh, the test plan, test specification, test results, and or the evidence, review evidence, uh, and other evidence uh, showing that you are uh, working according to your plans. So all these are subject to be uh, managed by the configuration management system. So uh, for all these work products, a single Git repository is typically not enough. But what we turned out to do is we introduce another meta Git repository, which have the uh, original Git repository, Git repository managing, managing the code as a sub-module. And in addition to that, the meta repository also uh, refers to other systems. For example, uh, the external requirement manager system we used uh, in our previous uh, round of certification to manage our requirement specification. Uh, it is a web-based uh, third-party application, so or we turn out to you, uh, record the URL of this specific version of the requirements into this uh, Git meta repo. And this is also applied uh, to the design, to the architecture design specification. And at the same time, for the test code, well, we also have separate Git repositories to manage these, and we add these repository as, again, some modules into the meta repository so that uh, in the end, we have a meta repository that can be tagged and provide a consistent version of all the work products we generate uh, during our life cycle. Following that, a natural question is about change. And this is why the change management uh, processes also change a bit how we work on the hypervisor uh, daily. So the open, again, the open source, typical open source practice is that uh, when there is a change required, uh, the author uh, cook a patch and submit to maybe a mounting list or, or GitHub issues, and the maintainers will be reviewing the changes there. But, but from uh, functional safety, uh, practice perspective, in addition to the code, now we have a collector of work products, including the requirements, the architecture design, and so on. So any change before being applied to any of them 
needs to be fully understood. So this means that we need to apply an, a round of impact analysis, resulting a summary of changes needed. And of, and of course, this summary not only uh, collects the impact to existing work product, but also it needs to consider the impact from safety perspective, whether it impacts any uh, safety concerns or it raises new safety concerns or uh, it mitigates or resolves some of them. So, or, uh, so this summary of changes is itself subject to a review and approval. And once approved uh, by the architects, we will apply the, uh, the proposed changes to all the work products and merge them together to make sure that uh, the uh, work product after uh, the, sub the changes is, uh, that are applied is still consistent. So these two are the major changes to our daily working model uh, due to the requirements of the supporting processes. So with the supporting processes set up, then the next now we are to uh, develop the hypervising the systematic way. And the very beginning of this whole development life cycle is to uh, draft a requirement specification or to specify the requirements of the hypervisor. So as the V model shows, the requirements are actually sit at the, as the roots of the whole traceability and as a result, all the verification activities. So a concise requirement is uh, essential in, uh, for the follow-up uh, phases of the development. But talking about the hypervisor, what's the requirement of a hypervisor? So the most straightforward understanding may be that the hypervisor is to partition the hardware for multiple VMs and to run multiple sets of software stacks simultaneously uh, and separately and you know, with some separation uh, guarantees. Uh, but wait, uh, this first thought needs to be revised because that is too ambiguous. So there is too much information that is not present in this forward requirement. For example, uh, partition to what extent? So when we talk about partition hardware, the hardware itself is very complex especially the device part. But when we talk about like partition the hardware, what devices need to be uh, assigned to partitions and what devices can be like uh, ignored to, to VMs. So this is what needs to be clarified in the requirements to make sure that the, uh, our uh, architecture design can derive the precise mechanisms for this partition, for this partition mechanism and the validation activities can validate the hypervisor in the precise way. And also, what's the capacity of the hypervisor? So we, we all know that the hyp a hypervisor cannot uh, support an unlimited number of VMs. At least it will be restricted by the hardware resources, but in some cases, it may also be restricted by some other aspects. So this capacity information needs to be there in the requirements as well so that system integrators can know when they have their system design, what kind of constraints they need to consider and make sure that their system design falls into the capacity of the hybrid. Also, uh, from VM perspective, uh, we already have uh, CPU processors uh, providing uh, a variety of features, but from virtual platform perspective, what are the features that are available so this information needs to be present again to system integrators because they need to uh, verify that uh, when they have a system, uh, when they have a safety function uh, which is uh, to be executed in the partition provided by the hypervisor. So all the features required by the safety function is also supported by the hypervisor. So there is some uh, consistency checks uh, when integrating the system, and these kind of like. Uh, hardware capability uh, exposure information is crucial in these activities. And, how, and, and, and also, so what's the boot protocol for these VMs? So what, what, are, what is the initial state where the hypervisor handles uh, to these VMs? So that, that's also part of uh, the information that needs to be specified precisely. And there is also a bunch of other details that it needs to be clarified as requirements, but it's not uh, included in this, uh, in this simple requirement. 
So as a result, we turned out to use a more, system, again, systematic or structured way to not only analyze, but also organize the requirements into one requirement specification work product. So conceptually, uh, the idea we use to analyze the requirements is to model the virtual VM, or more precisely, the virtual processors as state transition system. So that's a kind of state machine with labels on the transition. So here the states are, uh, the, the, the state includes regist the values in registers, uh, memory and devices, and state transitions are uh, uh, synchronous uh, instructions uh, or asynchronous events uh, triggered uh, by, the, uh, by, by, by the virtual processor. So of course, this is a very, very huge uh, state transition system, and there is, and it is, well, uh, close to infinitely, if ever possible, to um, uh, to define in, uh, in a complete and formal way. So our next strategy is that since uh, the hypervisor, the virtual machine is mimicking the physical platform, so we decide to leverage existing documents which specifies uh, the hardware. So whenever uh, the, uh, the feature or the functionality provided to virtual platforms or virtual VMs are, uh, is, are exactly the same as the hardware, we refer to the related documents for a detailed specification of the behavior. So of course, that serves as part of inf additional information provided for the validation, but during our requirement analysis or requirements, in our requirement specification, uh, we save a lot of effort not to like, duplicate uh, existing information into our work products. And last but not least, uh, the results of this analysis uh, are organized uh, in a specification in a systematic way. So we talk about different aspects like what's the virtual platform look like, what's, the, what's its initial states, and what are the state transitions uh, with regard to different instructions or features. Uh, from features or what uh, with regard to the asynchronous events and what are the defensive actions and other aspects for example security consideration of the hypervisor so all these are listed uh, and organized in the requirement specification and this specification is subject to uh, not only to the review or the assessment of the certification body but also as the foundation to derive the architecture specification and the validation test of the hypervisor. Okay, so with the requirements, we ended up uh, executing uh, the uh, later uh, development phases following our supporting processes uh, in a quite uh, smooth way. And that's how we achieved the certificate in our previous round of certification. So the last page, I will think, uh, recap some key uh, learnings uh, we we have we we had from our previous experience. So the first is that uh, the piece of software, the hypervisor in our case, needs to be fail safe, and it's not only fail safe uh, by applying some coding guidelines at code level or at detailed implementation level, but also fail safe by design. So uh, we need to uh, clarify and specify precisely uh, what kind of failure the piece of software may have or may need to tackle, and when the, failure at the, the failures are detected, uh, how the software needs to be reacted. So the detailed design needs to refer to this design and implement this, this design. And the test cases needs to verify that uh, under the case of these failures, the, the, uh, software, the piece of software under development really reacts in a specified way. And the second is that the management and development need to be conducted in a systematic way. And the systematic here means, of course, uh, you have plans beforehand you, and you collect evidence throughout uh, the execution. And the third is that uh, as, a very, uh, as a very important foundation of the development, development life cycle, the definition of the software or the requirements of the software is analyzed and specified in a systematic way so that we can reduce the additional effort for requirement changes in later phases. So that's what I have uh, for today's sessions to share. Uh, thanks for your time. And if you have any questions, 
feel free to uh, put them in the chat window and I'm, and I'm always there to answer your questions. Thanks for your time again.